transparency is, of course, an essential part of democracy. Yet, at the same time, police, intelligence agencies and military capabilities are all long-established parts of Australia's democracy. And there are situations where a level of secrecy is necessary for those things to be effective. You can call this a paradox, a balancing act, a tension, or a simple fact. It's certainly a fact that in our democracy, rules about both transparency and about secrecy are given force by laws made by elected members of our parliament. And boy, do we have a lot of those laws. Although much of the agenda of this transparency summit is of course about what might be called transparency laws, whistleblower protections, whistleblower incentives, freedom of information, I actually want to talk about the flip side, secrecy offences and secrecy laws. Is Australia the world's most secretive democracy? I'm not sure, but boy, we certainly have to be in the running for the title of democracy with the most secrecy laws. There are, I'm sorry, Senator Shubridge, to correct you, but there are actually not 350, but 875 secrecy offences and non-disclosure duties. And that's just Commonwealth law. I haven't counted state and territory. As independent national security legislation monitor, as you've heard, it's my role to review counterterrorism and national security laws to see how they're actually operating and if they remain necessary and proportionate. In essence, my small, my, I and my small but growing team operate like a specialist law reform body in this field. I have access to government briefings, classified information, but just as importantly, to the insights and submissions of civil society groups, legal and in, legal organisations and industry. I gather evidence, conduct hearings, and make reports that are tabled in Parliament. I operate under an Act, and while my own motion powers under that Act are largely limited to counter-terrorism laws, the Government of the Parliament can refer other matters to me. And in 2018, when very extensive changes were made to the Criminal Code to significantly expand Commonwealth secrecy laws and increase penalties, they're up to 10 years imprisonment now, the Parliament also amended my Act to require my office to do a review of those offences after a time. I've recently completed that review, and it wasn't a review of all 875 offences, just a dozen or so in the criminal code. But the principles are of wider application. Spoiler, I found that many of the criminal code offences were too broad, too uncertain, and that change is needed. But I have to say that that doesn't mean I don't think there is a place for appropriate secrecy offences. In my field, when it comes to intelligence, defence capabilities, and counter-terrorism, I do accept that there is some information that in the wrong hands can genuinely harm Australia's national interests and even the safety of individuals. But secrecy laws need to be carefully calibrated and regularly scrutinised so they do not apply to more information that is absolutely necessary or for longer than is absolutely necessary. I don't think it's controversial to say that excessive secrecy can have a chilling effect on public interest journalism, reduce accountability and undermine trust in government all of which are detrimental to the security and functioning of our democracy. My report makes 15 recommendations for change. Some were made, because as I said, I don't consider some of the offences to be necessary or proportionate, and some recommendations were based on inconsistencies with fundamental rule of law principles. In particular, the principle that laws, and especially criminal laws, including secrecy laws, need to be clear and certain. You'll be glad to know that there isn't time today to talk about all 15 recommendations. The full report's available on my website, but fair warning, it's 300 pages long. So we also post snippets and summaries on our LinkedIn page if that's how you prefer to get the news. But I want to just talk about a couple of recommendations that I think are of particular relevance to today's summit and to this audience, or which illustrate key principles. You can divide the offences in the criminal code into two camps. A bundle that apply just to officials, former officials, contractors, consultants, and a bundle that applies to everybody everybody else, including journalists. And I want to start with the everybody else offences. There are actually two of these everybody else offences, one for disclosing information, no surprises there, and one for dealing with information. I'll come back to that in a sec. On the disclosure one, briefly, I've made recommendations to narrow that offence so that, in essence, it's necessary to always establish that there was actually harm from a disclosure for a prosecution to be successful. I've also suggested more clarity on the kinds of serious harm that warrant a criminal penalty. 
I have recommended, and you probably know, there is already a defence for journalists who reasonably believe they're acting in the public interest, which I've said, of course, should remain. But it's that second everybody else offence, the one about dealing with, that I want to say a bit more about, because I have more problems with it. First, the term deal with includes receiving, possessing, making a record of, concealing, amongst other things, it's pretty broad. And it's not hard to imagine a scenario like this. Imagine a journalist, let's say that they cover national security and defence matters, they receive a bundle of documents in an envelope, or more likely a message via an encrypted app. They intentionally open it and read the documents. They look credible and relevant. But one stamped secret across the top. Well, receiving those documents was probably a crime. Just receiving them. Possessing it, well, that's another offence. But don't worry, because we're talking about a senior and experienced journalist, and they know what to do. They go straight to their lawyer. Hmm. Probably another offence. <laughs> the lawyer reads the documents. <laughs> Possibly another offence. But being a diligent lawyer, they make a file note. Definitely another offence. <laughs> she advises that for now, the documents should be locked up securely in the company safe. Is that concealing? Would that be another offence? <laughs> yes. Even if they decide to destroy the document and never publish the information, the journalist and the lawyer have probably committed serious offences. That doesn't seem right. Now, they may have defences, but that isn't the point. There may well be a sensible police policy or a good decision under a prosecutorial guideline not to proceed. Again, that's not actually the point. And it might even be true that if the information in that secret document truly needs to be kept secret, there is probably a greater risk that a foreign spy might have a greater chance of stealing it from a company safe than from the fortified compound of an intelligence agency, possibly. But that's not part of our legal system to require ordinary citizens to take action to prevent a third party, such as a foreign spy, from committing a different kind of crime, such as espionage, against the government. There are other ways to protect truly harmful information from foreign spies that undermining this sort of long-standing principle or creating extraordinarily wide offences for ordinary citizens and relying on police and prosecutorial discretion. I have recommended that the dealing with offence for non-officials be repealed in its entirety. I consider it to be unnecessary and disproportionate. Let me turn now to officials, contractors and others who perform work for the Commonwealth. This is a different category. These are people who voluntarily take on special duties to protect certain government information, especially those who take on jobs that require the highest level of trust and security clearances. I do think that disclosure and dealing with offences for officials can be appropriate, provided they are necessary and proportionate. And I acknowledge that an effective whistleblowing and oversight systems are part of assessing overall proportionality, though those laws were actually outside of my remit to review. Squarely inside the scope of what I reviewed is the, how the secrecy laws comply with the principle that the boundaries of what is and isn't a crime should be set by the parliament and judged by the courts, mm. and the principle that laws need to be knowable and certain. Some of my key recommendations go to laws that I think offend all of these principles. Let me give you one example. At the moment, it's an offence, it's a crime, to disclose a document only because it is marked a secret or top secret by an official in accordance with a policy. I don't actually doubt that there are some documents properly marked as secret or top secret that could cause real damage and even endanger lives if they were disclosed. But that sort of information is already covered by a whole heap of other offences. Having an extra offence just based on a classification decision might have seemed like an attractive idea to those who thought it might be easier to prosecute which, by the way, I don't actually think it would be. But as a matter of basic legal principle, I think it leaves too much room for administrative decisions and policy changes to alter the scope of criminal law without parliamentary oversight. And please don't even get me started on the fact that some of those policies are in fact themselves classified. <laughs> the law should require a court to be satisfied that there is at least a real risk of information of the information that's been disclosed being likely to cause harm to security, <coughs> defence or international relations or other narrow, specific public interests. <coughs> it's not enough to just set, for the court to just have to assess whether an official stamped it as secret in accordance with the policy of the day. Another offence that's been subject to criticism many times, and it's not just me, 
is the very broad general offence for an official breaching a duty not to disclose information. And it seems that even Parliament had some hesitations when creating this offence in 2018, as it originally was due to sunset, which means cease operating after five years, thought to be sufficient time to allow for a review of the then 295 non-disclosure duties that were attached to the offence. The Attorney General's Department published their report in 2013, and the sunset clause was extended by another year to allow a little more time. In June, my report set out some general principles relevant to any new offence, if one could be justified, and said that if you were going to create a new offence on the basis that you could do away with a bunch of other, some of the 875 odd offences, that you should bring that forward to Parliament at the same time so that they could assess the proportionality of the new offence, including by looking at what was going to be subtracted from the statute book. Apparently more time is needed because just last week the sunset clause was extended by another 18 months. It should be clear by now, and it will certainly be clear if you read my report, that I found that some of the criminal code secrecy offences were complex, uncertain, and in some cases excessive or unnecessary. But I didn't find that they'd been over-prosecuted. In fact, since 2018, when they were introduced, there hasn't been any prosecutions under these criminal code provisions, the Commonwealth's main secrecy laws. There have, of course, been a couple of high-profile matters that have been talked about today, but they were in relation to things that occurred before 2018. There's been a really significant expansion in the scope of our secrecy crimes in recent years, especially since 2018, both in the number of offences and their scope. As others have said today, Australia doesn't have constitutional guarantees or enshrined human rights to act as a check on such offences. So instead, we need other mechanisms, like independent reviews, to ensure our laws remain in balance. If they're amended as I've recommended, I do think that the criminal code secrecy laws have a role to play, and some of them should stay. As for the other 850 plus offences, well, there has to be real questions about why so many, and if they're even really needed in light of the breadth of the criminal code offences. That's a larger question, and something needs to be scrutinised alongside the effectiveness of whistleblower protections. In closing, let me say that in the face of growing threats from espionage and foreign interference, and perhaps a resurgence of terrorism or violent extremism driven by online radicalisation, it's tempting to think that we need to strengthen our laws. Instead, I think we need to strengthen our democracy, including by ensuring that our laws are clear, certain, necessary and proportionate. Intelligence and law enforcement agencies do important work. They're staffed by diligent people. But we need to be careful that the secrecy and other laws relating to these agencies do not undermine the very democracy and rule of law that we employ them to protect. Some of these rule of law issues and other questions of necessity and proportionality will be under the spotlight again in the current reviews being worked on by my office right now. We are in the midst of a review of certain police surveillance and disruption powers and another on espionage, foreign interference and sabotage laws. Stay tuned, there's more to come from my office. Thank you very much.